Thank you very much, Ilka, for this kind introduction. And also thank the organizers for this really nice opportunity to present my work here at this online seminar series. My talk will be about the tripartite transporters in cyanobacteria. And basically, it will be divided into three parts. And in the first part, I will give a brief introduction into cyanobacterial tripartite transporters and also tripartite transporters in general. Then in the second part, I will explain and discuss some results that I got during my PhD work in Tübingen, which I did with Iris Malden and Karl Vorhammer. And also in the third part, I will give a brief outlook on what I'm going to do in my future work, also as postdoc. And also, as I got some requests from you guys, I will give a very brief introduction in single particle cryo methodology. And at the end, I will just sum up all the results that I got in my PGD work and also will present here. So basically, tripartite transporters in gram-negative bacteria and also in cyanobacteria share very common architecture. And basically, they are composed of the outer membrane component, which is located in the outer membrane protein of the gram-negative bacterium, and cyanobacteria is the same. Then they also have the membrane fusion protein component that is located in the periplasm. And the third part of this tripartite compositions or assemblies is the inner membrane transporter, which energizes the whole system. So the most common thing among all these tripartite complexes is that they build the continuous tunnels through the whole gram-negative envelope, which allows the substrates to go from the inside of the cell to the outside. And the most investigated cyanobacterial tripartite transporters are different by their transporters in the inner membrane that drive the whole transport. So the first type belongs to the resistant nodulation and division family of transporters, this so-called R&D transporters that are driven by proton gradient. And they are usually responsible for multi-drug resistance, so for the export of some antibiotics, some drugs. And two other types of most investigated in cyanobacteria tripartite transporters. So there are some other tripartite transporters in other bacteria, but I won't discuss them here. So these two types belong to the ABC transporter family. So ATP binding cassette transporters that are driven by ATP binding and ATP hydrolysis. And these two transporter types are important for protein export or also for some drug export. Of course, they can also transport some lipids and some other stuff. And now I will just give a brief overview of tripartite systems in some model cyanobacteria, which are known or discovered so far. So I will start with synchrocystis, and it indeed has this tripartite transporters of these three types like R&D transporters and ABC transporter-driven tripartite complexes, which are essential for multidrug resistance, of course, and also for export of proteins involved in S-layer formation and also some stress tolerance. However, there are also some known tripartite transporters with still not yet discovered function or substrate. On the other hand, anabina, which is the multicellular model cyanobacterium, it grows as long filaments of vegetative cells, but also in conditions where the combined nitrogen is not present, it starts to develop and develops heterocysts, so specialized cells, which are specialized in nitrogen fixation. And special morphological thing about these cells is that they have additional envelope around them, formed by the polysaccharide layer and also glycolipid layer. Anabina, similarly to Synecocystis, also has a variety of discovered tripartite transporters from different types as well, also important for multidrug resistance or export of some proteins involved in stress tolerance, or also transporters with still not known functions. However, in contrast to Synecocystis, in heterocysts, it has some additional transporters that are also involved in heterosis glycolipid export, which, so these glycolipids then participate in formation of the heterosis envelope layer formation. And especially this transporter involved in heterosis specific glycolipid exports in anabina is one of the most investigated tripartite transporters in anabina. And now I'll give a brief overview of its functions and features. 
So basically, its architecture is rather common, still not yet structurally confirmed, but biochemically and functionally confirmed architecture is rather common. It is composed of the outer membrane protein in the outer membrane called HDDD, the membrane fusion protein DFB, and also the inner membrane ABC transporter composed of proteins DFC and DFA. And the genes encoding the components of these transporters belong to one operon, and also the gene of the outer membrane protein, HDDD, is located somewhere else in the genome, not in this operon. And now coming to the functions of this transporter, we can see that in the wild type heterocyst, so this is the transmission electron micrograph of the cross section of the heterocyst. The heterocyst envelope is nicely formed and is composed of the polysaccharide layer, which is rather thick. So this grayish diffuse one, and also the glycolipid layer, which is rather thin and more condensed. And both of these layers are present in the heterocyst of the wild type. However, if one of the genes of this cluster is mutated, for instance, this DFA, so the genus is corresponding to the nucleotide binding domain of the ABC transporter. The heterocysts of the mutant are lacking the glycolipid layer in the heterocyst envelope. So we see this nice grayish polysaccharide layer, but the rather dense and thinner black layer is missing here. So apparently something is wrong in export of formation of this glycolipid layer in the mutant. Then it also was biochemically confirmed using surface plasmon resonance method that the proteins participating in the formation of this tripartite complex indeed interact with each other. So here on the left graph, it is shown that the outer membrane protein HDDD is interacting with the membrane fusion protein DFB. And on the right side, it's shown that the membrane fusion protein DFB is interacting with the inner membrane transporter DFCA. So indeed, they are most probably forming this tripartite assembly as predicted. Furthermore, it was also shown that if in vitro you mix the ABC transporter proteins with the DFP proteins and also with the heterocyst glycolipids as putative substrate, the ATP hydrolysis rate will be the highest in this case. So this also indicates the fact that most probably the heterosis glycolipids are one of the substrates of this transporter. So the results of this works demonstrated that mutants in the genes encoding the components of this tripartite transporter are deficient in the heterosis glycolipid layer. And the most probable substrate of this transporter is also heterosis glycolipids. So most probably the transporter is important for the secretion of heterosis specific glycolipids and it is indeed the tripartite assembly. So if we look in the genome of Anabina and search for the homologous genes of membrane fusion proteins probably participating in formation of tripartite transporters indicated in this cartoon, we would find rather large variety of these genes. And some of them, at least six, are highly similar to the DFB gene, which I discussed a couple of slides ago. And also, there is some data available on the functions of some of these membrane fusion protein genes of Anabina. And some of them are important for heterosis development, as also discussed before. Some others are important for multidrug resistance or for metal acquisition. However, many of them are still undiscovered or not well investigated. Therefore, I aimed during my PhD work to discover functions of some of them, including LL5304, LL5347, LL3647, and LL4280. So coming to the results of my work, I will start with the HDDBC, which is the components of another putative tripartite transporter. So these two genes form a cluster and most probably code for proteins that form parts of this tripartite transporter. However, the gene of the NBD, so of the nucleotide binding domain of the ABC transporter is missing in this cluster. So most probably this transporter recruits some ATPase, which is encoded somewhere else in the genome. And also as an outer membrane protein, it most probably recruits the HDDD because it's the only known gene encoding such proteins in Anabina genome. So now coming to the phenotype of the mutant, 
which I created in the first gene of the cluster, I could show that the mutant couldn't grow without any combined nitrogen source, meaning that most probably it has some aberrant heterosis, which was later confirmed also by Holter structure experiments. So here again, in the transmission electron micrograph of the cross-section of the heterosis of the vial type, the boss layers of the heterosis envelope can be nicely seen. So this grayish layer of the polysaccharide as well as the darker and more dense layer of the glycolipids are present. However, in the mutant, in the first gene of the cluster, the layer corresponding to the glycolipids is rather diffuse and maybe a little bit disorganized and not so well present as in the wild type. So most probably these components of mutative transporter are important for maybe deposition of this layer. And in addition, the fusion of the second gene of the cluster to GFP resulted in the localization of the transporter to the heterosis, which also indicated that this transporter must do something in the heterosis. So the results of this experiment demonstrated that the transporter components HDDB-C are most probably involved in the export of heterosis-specific glycolipids and that this putative transporter is indeed localized in the heterosis of anabina. So now coming to another investigated gene, the ILL5304, which also encodes a putative membrane fusion protein of another tripartite transporter. So this gene is localized alone in the genome without any other genes which might code for some ABC transporter, for instance. This means probably that the transporter, if it is present, just recruits some other ABC transporter also encoded somewhere else in the genome of Anabina, since there are many ABC transporter genes present there. When I mutated the gene ALL5304, I could show that the mutant couldn't grow at quite low pH in while the wild type still could. So there was a hint that this putative transporter might play some role in acid stress tolerance of anabina. In addition, when we compared the culture medium protein content of the mutant and the wild type culture, we could see also some differences. For instance, some proteins which were found in the wild type culture medium were missing in the mutant medium, probably indicating that these proteins might not be secreted or exported in the mutant. So this experiment indicated that the LL5304 protein, which might be part of another tripartite transporter, that might play a role in protein secretion and somehow also be important for acid stress tolerance of anabina. And now coming to other gene clusters that are homologous to the VCA gene cluster or operon, this ILR4280, 4281, and 82 and ILR 36, 47, 48, and 49. Both of them are quite similar and most probably also encode components of two different tripartite transporters, which probably have the common tripartite assembly architecture as indicated in this cartoon, and also probably involve the outer membrane protein HDDD. And both of them having the similar functions as we will know from the next slides. Therefore, I just put them together in my presentation. So I also mutated the first genes in each of the cluster and compared their phenotypes. And I could demonstrate that both of the mutants in the genes encoding membrane fusion proteins in each of the transporter couldn't grow on a variety of antibiotics in comparison to the wild type. So this probably means that these gene clusters encode components of tripartite transporters that are involved in multidrug resistance of anabina. So they extrude some drugs or antibiotics from anabina to protect it from them. And now having the functions of these genes discovered, I decided to also find out what the functions of these proteins and to confirm this in vitro. And to do so, I recommendedly overproduced and purified the proteins. And for the beginning, just the membrane fusion proteins, ILR4280 and ILR 3647. And as you can see from the size exclusion chromatogram presented here, the two protein samples formed two different peaks. And as it was confirmed later by the cross-linking experiments, both 
of the peak fractions contained my proteins. However, in the first peak, there were tetrameric, trimeric, and monomeric species of the protein, while in the second peak, there were only monomeric species. And this picture was almost identical for both of the protein, as you see also. And now, actually, I could show that I can overproduce and purify these proteins, these components of tripartite transporters, which actually brings me to my outlook on my current and future work. After my PhD project, I wanted to study the functions and also the structure of cyanobacterial tripartite transporters. And I joined the group of Anna Möller, who is an expert in cryo of ABC transporters and also other membrane proteins. And he has given me the generous opportunity to study this cyanobacterial ABC transporters and tripartite transporters using cryo. And now I will give a brief introduction into cryo method because I think it's quite interesting and I think worth of discussing here as well. So basically, each single particle cryon project starts from the protein sample production. So it includes, of course, protein overexpression, purification, activity measurement, and so on. Basically, this is already something that I did for the membrane fusion proteins LR4280 and 3647, as I showed several slides ago. And finally, you got your perfect protein sample in solution. And once you get this, you can go to do cryo-AM. And to do so, you just put your sample on a cryo-AM grid. And this grid, when it's highly magnified, it contains an array of multiple and small holes. And these holes, when the sample is applied on the grid, are occupied by the buffer or the liquid with the protein, which forms this very thin film in the holes of the grid. And the protein in this sample, in, in this liquid, adopts a variety of different orientation and it rotates and it's placed in multiple views, so to say. So then when the sample is applied on the grid, the grid then very quickly frozen in liquid ethane. And during this process, this thin film of liquid with the protein becomes so-called vitreous ice, which is rather homogeneous substance and electron transparent. And at the same time, the protein is still present in more or less native form there. So once the protein and the sample is frozen, it's just transferred to the cryo-electron microscope and multiple images are collected on the sample grid from different areas from the grid. But then when the data is collected, the data needs to be processed in order to get a high resolution 3D structure. And this cryo data processing is based on the concept that if you have multiple 2D images of different views of a particle or a protein, they can be computationally transferred to a 3D reconstruction of such a protein. And this is exactly the case that we have here in, in cryon because the protein, when it's frozen, it, it adopts different orientations in this thin film of the buffer on the grid. And then you can get this different 2D views of this protein. Basically, on the right side of the slide, you see the scheme which represents the basic workflow of cryon data processing. So first the images are collected and uh, corrected, and then all single particles of the protein, of the same protein that is found in the sample are peaked. Then this 2D images of every single protein molecule are averaged and classified in 2D in order to get some more high resolution features and also to remove some bad images. Afterwards, these images are used to produce 3D reconstruction, which is then defined and afterwards is used to build 3D structural model of the protein. And basically using this approach, I am going to first, of course, to overproduce, purify and reconstruct the whole tripartite transporter complexes from Anabina, most probably those having LR4280 or LR3647 as membrane fusion proteins, and then to use single particle cryom to obtain the structure of these complexes. And the Möller lab actually moved from MPE Frankfurt to Osnabrück University, and now I have established growing cyanobacteria here. 
and the microscope is also going to arrive very soon. So hopefully I will get some more results in very near future. So summing all up, I could discover in during my PhD multiple functions of several components of tripartite transporters in Anabina. And some of them, like AGDDBC, are most probably parts of the tripartite transporter involved in secretion of heterospecific glycolipids. Another one, LL5304, is part of a putative tripartite transporter essential for acid stress tolerance and is probably a protein exporter. And two other putative tripartite transporters, ILR4280, 81, 82, and ILR3647, 8, and 9, are multi drug resistance transporters of Anabina. And with this, I would like to thank my PhD supervisors, Iris Malden and Kanpo Hammer, for introducing me to the field of cyanobacteria and also the tripartite transporters, and also for being the excellent mentors. And also, I would like to thank Anne Müller, my postdoc advisor, for giving me the opportunity to work further on my project and to learn such a great technique at Ascrium. Also, I would like to thank Werner Kühlbrand and also all the members of the Maldener. Bahama and Möller Labs for the continuous support during my work and also the funding of this project and also some other project of mine. And also I thank you for your attention.